Hello, and welcome to our ISTD live event, Dante, a typographic conversation. I'm Brenda Dermody. I'm a designer, researcher, author, and educator based at TU Dublin. I'm also the deputy head of education and a fellow of ISTD. In this series of live events, we aim to gather insight from practitioners and academics through focusing on their typographic practice and research. And tonight we are delighted to welcome Dr. Catherine Dixon and Barry Tullett, who will be in conversation about the typographic Dante, a body of more than 100 letterpress, typewriter and letterset works made by Barry Tullett over three decades. Catherine and Barry will be in conversation for approximately 40 minutes this evening. Before I introduce our speakers, we have some notices. The International Society of Typographic Designers is a professional body run by and for typographers, graphic <coughs> designers and educators. The Society has an international membership who share and support its aim to create and inspire interest in all forms of typographic practice. I would like to offer sincere thanks to Tony Pritchard, Belinda McGee, Brian Palmer, David Coates and Sabina Muller, who have helped to make this evening happen. And so to our speakers. Dr. Catherine Dixon is a designer, researcher and writer with a particular interest in the history of lettering and contemporary typographic practice. She contributes to a range of design journals and websites, including I and Font Stand, on subjects such as typographic education and fonts, and she's a regular speaker at conferences. She teaches on the Graphic Communication Programme at Central St. Martin's University of the Arts London, supervises ongoing typographic research and helps oversee the Central Lettering Record, an archive of lettering practices with an emphasis on architectural lettering, which forms part of the college's museum and contemporary collections. Barry Tullett is Programme Leader for Graphic Design at the University of Lincoln and is co-founder of the Case Room Press, an artist's book collective based in Lincoln and Edinburgh. As a freelance graphic designer, his clients have included Canon Gate Books, Princeton University Press and Penguin Books. Barry is the world's leading expert in typewriter art and is the editor of the book Typewriter Art, a Modern Anthology, published by Lawrence King in 2014. Barry has been working on the typographic Dante for 30 years. To date, this body of work has been exhibited in Dublin, London, Edinburgh and the National Centre for <coughs> and Design in Sleaford, Lincolnshire. So I'll hand you over to Barry and Catherine and let's begin. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, Barry. Let's start with an introduction to the work. Um, we're here to have a conversation about a particular project. So if you could kind of give us a, an introduction um, for the benefit of the, those that don't know the work and for the enjoyment of those that do. <laughs> so uh, we get to spend some more time with it. So if you wouldn't mind um, setting the scene for us. Um, uh, as, as soon as the um, host allows me to screen share, I will. It's um, ah! currently <laughs> Uh, you, oh, my bad. One second. Maybe that's a maybe that's here a. Here we go. Oh, got it. Thank you. Off we go. So, um, the typographic Dante. It's uh, technically it's a series of hundred typographic illustrations. Although, um, I've had a rethink, and it's going to be three hundred now. Uh, from the 100 Cantos of Dante's Divine Comedy. Uh, for the first book, Inferno, the illustrations are letterpress. For the second book, Purgatory, the illustrations are credible typewriter. And for the third book, Paradise, uh, from Letraset. So uh, the history of, uh, of, of, it, of it all. Um, Dante was a poet, an Italian poet, prose writer, and literary theorist, a moral philosopher, the political thinker best known for the a monumental epic poem, La Commedia, later renamed The Divine Comedy. Um, I was at a book fair uh, a while ago and I had a, one of the artist books I'd made as a kind of proof copy of, of, the, of, the, of the set. And someone came up to me at the, at the fair and he said, oh, that, is this you? And he pointed to Dante, Dante's name on the cover of the book. He said, no, no, he's the poet. I did the illustrations. And he said, is, is he here? Is Dante here? So um, I didn't like to throw him dead. I thought it'd be awkward. So I said he'd gone for coffee and he just missed him. Um, so the Divine Comedy is a narrative poem begun around 1308 and completed in 1320 and widely considered to be the preeminent work in Italian literature and one of the greatest works of world literature. Um, according to the Dante Society, uh, no original manuscripts uh, written by Dante survive, although there are many, many, many uh, copies, about 800. And I think if one of the interesting things that came up in the conversation that we'd had um, with Brenda and um, Catherine about this was the, 
I suppose in some ways the work I've been doing unknowingly in, it really goes back to this point where text and image were the same thing. There was no, there was no distinction between the image and the text. They were exactly the same thing. And you can read the image in, uh, as a picture or as a piece of, of, of writing. And I think some of what I'm doing maybe goes back to these kind of manuscripts. Um, it's been translated into Latin, French, Spanish, other European languages well before we translated into English. And I think one of the things that's interesting about these, these translations, the books are, are, are mad things, you know, in terms of typographic weight. They're quite insane, I think, um, which are quite lovely as a typographer to, to look at and to reference. And uh, this is um, the English translation, the first English complete translation of the Divine Comedies in 1802. And apparently, it was due to Dante's Catholic views being distasteful to Protestants' English audiences. But again, they're, they're incredibly dense. The earliest copy I've got is on the right, it's from 1868. And um, it's an incredibly dense piece of text. And it's also very, very small point sizes. So I don't know, I always imagine people reading by lamplight, but they must have had incredibly good glasses. Um, so the English translations, uh, the, uh, Dante wrote it in 1314, Sir John Harrington um, wrote, uh, I think he translated Inferno, not the Divine Comedy, or parts of the Inferno in 1591. My, um, my first proper engagement with it as a piece of actual academic text, I suppose, rather than as a kind of piece of pop culture was the Dorothy L. Sayers translation. I didn't read it in 1949, she wrote it in 1949. And uh, we did a book recently with, um, I did a book with Russell Spearer recently, which was um, all different translations of um, the, the first three lines and Alexander Selenich, I thought was the most perfect, perfect, one of the last ones in the book, Midlife, Darkwood, Path Lost. Um, originally, this kind of part about as a final major project when I was a student at Chelsea. Um, and, I, I kind of had the idea of doing the Inferno with letterpress and my original thought was that um, purgatory will be the Mac because it had just come in but all, all the work I'd done was um, uh, we, we, did, we did paste up work and it was, it was how I kind of understood graphic design to be and then the Macs came in in, in 84 didn't they and we had them I think at Chelsea in 87 the little Mac pluses I found them terribly difficult to work with. I didn't like them at all. So that was, that was purgatory for me. And I thought paradise would be calligraphy because I thought calligraphy is a wonderfully beautiful thing. But um, the project took quite a while and I obviously got used to the Mac quite quickly. So the Mac was no longer a bad thing. It was a very positive thing. And um, the calligraphy, I was never any good at calligraphy, never ever got the hang of it. So it kind of began to, to, to kind of form this idea uh, if de I called it Dead Technologies and got in trouble for it. The Inferno will be letterpress, which was no longer a commercially viable uh, um, process, and then typewriter art for uh, Purgatory, and then Electroset for Paradise, all of which were no longer commercially viable processes, but were processes that I'd been involved with and understood as a designer. And, you know, uh, so they were kind of, they were still kind of um, things I was very familiar with. So the Inferno uh, are letterpress prints. Um, they are all, all the prints are smaller than A4. One of the original decisions I made at Chelsea was that I wanted to put, uh, use paper that could be filled by the type we had, but um, that kind of, and also on the presses we had, so that's how we kind of used it. And then uh, Purgatory's typewriter pieces. And again, you have a different kind of thinking about those because of the, obviously the size of the font in uh, typewriters is you know very limited so you have a different way of thinking about how you fill the page and then uh paradise in letter set uh, i did i did give myself whenever whenever you use letter set commercially as a designer um you always used to use a photocopier to blow the type up and down to make it different sizes so i did give myself the the flexibility to make the artwork then photocopy it and, and use it as i used to so I, I gave myself a bit of a get out of jail free card in some ways um, but, but the odd thing about the processes, I suppose, is that letterpress is, you can only use what you've got. So you're limited by the, the actual wooden metal type that you own or have access to, but you can print it endlessly. Typewriters, you've only got, you're going to have one or, one or two fonts. You know, I've only got, I've got two different point sizes. One's 12 points, uh, 12 characters to an inch, one's 10. And I've got two different fonts. One's a, 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 a Gothic Sans and one's a, 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 a Roman. And 
but you can use you can keep typing until you run out of patience. But with lecture set, you're always aware that it's it's finite. It's the last one. That, you know, this is the sheet you've got, and it it no longer you can't buy it new again. So every, every time you do a piece of work, you're reducing the amount of opportunity you have to do more work with it. So I think that's a, a slightly terrifying process because every time you use it, you know you've got to make it the right choice because otherwise you've you've wasted it. I'll take a breath now. Thank you so much. <laughs> just packed into <laughs> so much just packed into that opening opening set of ideas. So these are a set of typographic illustrations and given the 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 importance of the of dante and the divine comedy uh, as a as a piece of literature your work is sitting in a long line of 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 of, of other um, approaches to illustrating the text and from the ornamental illustration in the manuscripts that you were showing um to printed versions and some of the illustrations you were showing in in the, even in those early printed books and the, and you showed the tom phillips as well so there's a whole range of relationships of text and image i really liked what you said about this is dating from a time when there wasn't so much differentiation between text and image but that's a really critical point because there's something about your approach and the way that you've used typography as a as a form of illustration that as one of the dante scholars mika provata carlona and apologies for what i've just done to, done to mika's name there but she says of your work that it does something unprecedented um she says talit aims at capturing what one can only call the idea of an image. Unlike every other illustrator of the Commedia, he does not create a single figurative image of Dante, Virgil or Beatrice, or of anything that can be passively or objectively perceived by the eye of the beholder. The resulting illustrations are not concrete and abstract, a consummate distillation of the, oh, sorry, the resulting illustrations are both concrete and abstract a consummate distillation of the essence of each of the poem's cantos using the atomic particles of written language letters and typographic markings. For perhaps the first time in the publishing history of the Commedia, the tacit gap between text and illustration between word and image is bridged. So how did you, how did you <laughs> arrive at this idea of thinking about how to illustrate typographically and how have you kind of, what's the kind of breadth in terms of the way that you've explored and pushed that as an idea? So you're not literally taking words and putting words or kind of doing that weird sort of Instagrammy, like here's a bit of Dante and I'm going to set it in letterpress. This is something different. How did you get there and, and, what, and, and tell us about that approach? I suppose it's quite a, a convoluted path. I mean, one, one of the interesting things, this came up from that conversation you just mentioned, and I spoke to Brenda about it yesterday. Um, almost every illustrator draws Dante and Virgil and they are centre stage. And it never occurred to me to draw Dante and Virgil because I was, he was describing what he sees. It's a first person narrative. So Dante's always telling you that this is where he is. So I never ever thought to include him in the images at all. You know, Dante's in the Wood of Suicides. He's the Wood of Suicides that he can see. And the only two I've realised looking through it, the only two times there's a reference to them as, 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 as characters. On the left in um, Purgatory, the, 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 the black smoke consumes them and they, they're lost. And I used a, a reference to medieval manuscripts of, of Virgil wearing purple and Dante wearing blue. And Virgil is the, the purple line and Dante is a, a, a staccato blue line. And then on another canto, the, 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 the souls of the sinners in purgatory realize that Dante is alive because they see his shadow. He actually has a corporal body and they gather around him. And there is this idea of, of Dante being the lowercase i as the, as the kind of pupil and, and mm -hmm. Virgil being the uppercase i as the, as the tutor. As a, and um, they're the only two times, that's the only time I think in my entire illustrations that they actually make an appearance as characters. But the um, the, the beginnings, it was quite a convoluted path. I did, um, I was very lucky, I think, in that my A-level art was a very fine art-based A-level. And then you did a foundation course. And I was lucky enough to do my foundation at St. Martin's. And again, it was a very open-ended foundation course where you did lots of different things and you were encouraged to draw and paint, make sculptures. We got introduced to the, 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 the printmaking workshop and letterpress and all these things. And after a small hiccup of being out of uh, art school for about three years, I finally got to Chelsea to do my degree. 
Chelsea had a visual communication course, which is what I studied. And then in second year, so the first year was quite a broad range of things that you did. In the second year, you could choose a pathway. And I kind of initially, I kind of bumped about between illustration and graphic design. So I wasn't really, I was doing lots of work. I wasn't really good at either. And I ended up being an illustration student, technically, but I was in the print room but only the case room part of the print when we had a church at Hugh Gwynne Road in Chelsea. And I was making these illustrations using type. So I thought of myself as an illustrator, but rather than print making these screen printing or etching or line of cuts, which I also did, I was using letterpress to make the pictures. And, and sometimes they are, they are pictures of things sometimes, you know, uh, the, the dark wood is a the text is supposed to represent the forest you know the, the wood of suicide the text is supposed to represent the the, 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 the trees and uh, one of the things that Mika said was you know they, they show oppression and existential or spiritual darkness and I think one of the things that's interesting about the project as you go along is that initially I was printing onto the paper and you could see the paper come through and at various points, I thought I want to get rid of the paper entirely and, and, and work away from that so that the, the, the entire surface is covered. I think that's part of that you know, spiritual darkness, Dante being lost. So the, the letter forms are lost in that darkness as well. And um, she talks about ambivalence, transition and transformation. And I think they, they do. It's, it's a fascinating text, you know, I mean, uh, in, in Mount Purgatory, you know, you can only uh, ascend Mount Purgatory during the daylight hours as soon as the sun sets you have to stop and you know in terms of transformations my original drawing and there are drawings um, um, I think Peter Finch mentioned it was really interesting that I always refer to them as illustrations rather than pieces of concrete poetry or, or typographic you know they are illustrations and the original one on the one on the left was uh, was with a black and red typewriter ribbon so it's a, a black and white image as it were and then I bought more ribbons and I sort of reworked it in the, in the pinks and reds of the, of the sunset. So it, it that, you know, transformed itself. And then the one on the right is interesting because Dante talks about the northern and southern hemisphere and it's, you know, the world is round, the medieval understanding of the world of the globe and the, the heavens moving and stuff is all quite interesting. I think. And then, you know, using the other mediums and uh, the contemplation and nuance. And I think using the lecture set, which is this, the paradise is about perfection, God's perfection and God's symmetry. And you're using, I wish I'd been a bit more clever about all this. I started doing it all 30 years ago, rather than kind of doing it in sequence. Because my, my lecture set is now 30 years old and most of it's, a lot of it's falling apart. So you try to work <laughs> with it and it, it flakes off and it breaks and it, you know, you, you do the piece of work and you blow the dust away and the entire piece of work disappears. And uh, so there, was a, there was a contemplation and some trouble. Nuances. Also, that process of how I want to print it. I want it to print it in gold. Paradise is about heavenly light, you know. And um, at the moment, there were isographed in gold. But I wonder if, you know, whether they're not being screen printed in gold. It used to be a screen printer commercially. So it's a kind of nice thought about going back to doing that in some ways. Or whether they should be foil blocked or something. So it's a kind of things to think about in terms of the, it is a contemplative process. And, sorry. I was just going to say, how else? I mean, how else does how else do you work with color? I mean, what other did you make any sort of sort of baseline decisions like that about how color between between each of the books? I think I think the um, initially when, when we were when we were students, uh, graphic design was placed up. So you 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 stuck pieces of black material, letters, whatever it will be, onto a piece of card, and then you put a tracing paper overlay on it and told the printer or the tutor what, what, what colour you wanted to be so the world was black and white and the new the, the, the max when they came in were black and white and the, and the laser printers were black uh tech you know black toner only so when i was working with letterpress we had this coat system of inks which was 12 different ink tubs and, and it was a brilliant system it was like half of this and a third of that gives you this colour half this quarter of that and a third of this gives you this colour and you could mix this wonderful spectrum of colours so the, i just I know that in theory, I think Inferno is, is basically blood red or shit brown. That's the entire <laughs> palette of the Inferno. But there's, there's no way I was going to limit myself. You know, I had this opportunity to do all these nice colourful things. So my Inferno is ridiculously colourful. There should probably be an addition of my work where I just do, do a duotones and the duotones are brown and red, you know. But I had this wonderful, wonderful, glorious 
color palette to use and it's it's completely at odds you know my waterfalls are the bluest blues you know and uh, my snakes are the greenest greens i know it's all very basic sort of thinking but and it should, really should be muddy water but it's not and then purgatory originally i only had black and red ribbons so that was what i was using but then since i started doing it more and more manufacturers are making colored ribbons so now i have this huge range of colors it's um black red blue green silver pink uh brown uh, white you know there's this glorious range of, of ribbons to use so that's altered how i can think about those so i've gone back and retyped some of the illustrations to bring more color into those and then purgatory because it is this idea of the heavenly lights there are different tones to things as you go through paradise there are different uh, colored cast different spheres of heaven but at the moment my thinking is that it will be it will all be printed in gold although one of the things i'm concerned about as if it matters you know i'm concerned about this is that the, the typewriting and letterpress gives an overlay where you can have a density of image and color whereas printing it in gold just is flat so i still need to think about how i can maintain that depth of imagery and yeah. one of the things that uh, the risographs did when I was printing them and overprinting them was give me that kind of that, that, that sense of uh, an overprint. Yeah, I mean, I will come back to the fact that it's not finished yet. The <laughs> previous slide actually was about text and image because yes. when I saw the work, I saw it in the exhibition uh, that you had at the Poetry Library at the South Bank uh, two or three years ago. Um, and I was, yeah, curious about. It is interesting that, that there is text and image and you have got you've reproduced the text and you have your illustrations which are typographic next to it so there is a clear you know that distinction in your head but but that this is only an iteration isn't it of yes yeah I, I, I made the artist books for the exhibitions and I used a, a prose version of uh, of the inferno um, with the notes and that gives you its own joy you know thinking about how the notes work and things and how you compose the text but i'm aware that it is very disparate there is a picture which is you know it would be tipped in back in the day wouldn't it it'll be it would be a full color plate that would be tipped into the, the black and white illustrations and i think with some of the other older pieces of work you look at when it's it's more integrated or even the idea of taking the illustrations and being more experimental with the text matter itself and Ken Cohen, the Coben, the poet I worked with, suggested that, you know, I used a, a, a existing piece of text. He said, you, know, you must know enough to write your own version. But I know Tom Phillips to learn, I think he learned Italian just to translate his version, you know, which I thought was just chilling off really. So, you know, yeah, I'm not busy. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that. But I, I, I think um, there is, uh, this is just something about the idea of, <laughs> things that run through things there's, there's the, you know, the angels obviously there's a lot of angels in the, in the divine comedy and the idea of the angel which was initially inspired by a piece by um jeremy adler leaf like bird this idea of the angels wings and the halo and how that can be translated into letterpress and typewriter and um into a letter set but i'm also aware that's a very very naive kind of angel if you read the the, the bible i think angels look more like that don't they they're, they're really they're really freaky things they're really these are not the things that are going to make you think oh good god's here they're going to make you think oh dear god I've done, <laughs> I've done too many mushrooms so i think you know i want to part of the idea of doing more illustrations to, is to explore more kind of visual visual ideas i think so you've talked already a little bit about the fact that you you, you, know, you began this project when you were, stu were a student and it's clearly evolved and we'll talk a little bit more about that evolution as well but what why why dante <laughs> i'm glad you asked it's almost like i planned this um, <laughs> i grew up in Wolverstow in east london um, my dad's from aberdeen my mum's from east london and uh we used to go to a cinema i don't know essex was closer i think at the time than it is now because i remember walking past the border of london to essex i don't know how i don't know a long time ago, I was at 13, and some of the red spray painted a line in the road that said, Abandon all hope, ye who enter Essex. Not as a friend, it was very well read. He'd read uh, all the, the classics, including Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, he laughed and said it was a reference to Dante. And I'd, I'd like to say that I rushed home and I, I got my copy of, you know, Dorothy L. Sayers' translation of Dante in the middle. I didn't. Um, I, I actually read. 
<laughs> a role-playing version uh, about for Dean advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And then I read a science fiction version by Larry Niven, which I thought was fantastic. And then I read as a Marvel Comics version, the X-Men. So my introduction to Dante was very much a pop culture introduction. And so I was very aware of it as a narrative, especially the Inferno, not the entire Divine Comedy. And the Inferno is by far the most popular um, book to illustrate. If you look at the amount of people that have illustrated the, the Divine Comedy, the Inferno gets the most hits by far. It's the most visceral and the most, you know, representational, I think. And then it gets less and less people do the, the, the other book. In terms of your, I mean, uh, Dante has Virgil to guide him through. Who have you, who've been your kind of Virgil figures to guide you through the land of Dante? I mean, so this is a lovely assemblage of references of, uh, uh, and a total justification of, it, it kind of doesn't matter what people read as long as they're kind of reading and pulling different references into their work. It's amazingly rich. But what, uh, in, who were the who were the who were the kind of people that you that really helped you steer your path through this as a project? I suppose um, the, the various teachers. I mean, Jeremy Verrier, who taught me when I was at school, uh, was a fantastic kind of. He was the first person I think that was as excited by comics as he was by uh, the, the Rothko in the tape. You know, he 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 was excited by all these mediums. And he was the first person that kind of, I think, bridged that gap between having a, a contemplative experience of Rothko and then going and reading comic book and, and being excited by the narrative of the, of the comic book. And then when I got to Chelsea, I mean, it, uh, on my foundation, it was, um, there was a Robin Bagelhole, who was a screen printer and an anarchist, who was the most insanely wonderful man. And uh, then my degree, like John Newman and Dave Strickland were just John Newman just told you to read things that had nothing to do with your work, but just always brilliant things to read or listen to or watch, you know. I had no idea what on earth it meant, but it was so good. It was always good. And Dave Strickland had this huge knowledge of, he would just tell you, oh, you should read this article by that person. You should look at the work of that person. You should go and look at Typographica, you know, and he'd just be feeding you these little hints about what you might enjoy. And then there was Frances Corner, who was really, uh, really good at Chelsea as well. I think she's a... She was head of fashion, I think, at London College of Fashion. She, she taught drawing at Chelsea and just that love of drawing and the fact that drawing as a process could be go alongside all the other things you did was uh, really important. Then there's a the kind of artist you look at, Steve McCaffrey, who I've got to meet recently, which is wonderful. And, you know, John Furnival, H. M. Workman, you know, people like that, and uh, Dom Sylvester Huardard, and that, those kind of people that, that, that you look at the work of and just I just I can't understand how they do it you know I just stare at their work and just can't understand how they managed it you know? so your so your kind of ideas about Dante so that as a sort of nascent project that was really well supported um I, I think it, it wasn't it was it came together quite slowly I think I mean I was very lucky you know my my initial interest in it visually it was you know Gustave Doré and William Blake and Salvador Valley and I think one of the foundation tutors said that the first three artists you liked Doré, Blake and Dali and the first three artists you let go of are Doré, Blake and Dali but I never never really let go of them you know I don't think I've ever had in the same way I've never let go of all the pop culture references so I you know and, and and I think it's interesting to go from quite esoteric work from you know concrete poetry to uh, you know other kind of pop culture and things um and one of the things i i, I really do like researching one of the things that interests me is that I'm, I'm, i research visual uh, uh, artifacts I, I look at illustrators to see how they've illustrated different aspects of the text even though i'm not going to be illustrating it in the way they did and you know, the eight Thompson manuscript from 1450 you, there's a digitized version of the british library which is amazing there's this sequential narrative which is always majority of the time Virgil and Dante are like Ant and Deck they, they stand on either side of each other so you know which one's which and, and uh, Virgil's in the purple and Dante's in the blue and they they appear several times in the same frame because they're moving across the picture plane in the way you would read them across a book and there are things like how you would draw a fire if you're a medieval manuscript monk and, you know, and you can't see fire photograph like we can so it's these kind of like little fiery tendrils and that leads into my work the way you might draw fire using a typewriter and I like the other one, the Robert Catterson Smith, you know, with this, um, again, Dante and Virgil appear twice in the same picture. And I like the fact they've all got little hints above their heads, you know, there's a B and the D for, for Virgil and Dante, just in case you get stuck, and Beatrice has a name attached to it. So I love these kind of like little textual uh, hints at who you're looking at. 
and I've always collected different illustrators. This was a brilliant set by Nuraje, uh, The Inferno by Lorenzo Matotti, Purgatory by Milton Glaser. I mean, <laughs> what a find that was. What a find Amoebus, who's a comic strip artist, the French comic strip artist, did Paradise. So you have this insane, in that one collection, insane range of different cultural clashes, you know, as an, an illustrator, a designer, and a comic book artist. And, you know, I was always very, it was an exhibition of the, of the, of the Dante of uh, Rauschenberg, I think, at the Tate when I was a student. And I remember finding the Barry Moser book in uh, the, 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 um, uh, the Mandelbaum edition. I found it in a second hand shop, I think, or found it cheap or something. So I managed to get hold of that. And these beautiful illustrations by Barry Moser. And then people like Donald Newman used different kind of techniques, more like Rauschenberg. So all those things were kind of percolating through. And I had, I had to come up with a final major project. And I was, I was working on letterpress, typography, um, mail art, art in the post, based on sort of overheard comments, which looking back on it probably would have worked quite well as, um, uh, because it would have fed into concrete, my interest in concrete poetry. And I think it would have become a more structured thing. But at the time it was just very freeform. And then someone showed me the work of Phil Baines who had been at the been at St Martin's, I think he graduated in 85, I think, and I was there in 83, 84 at the foundation. And he'd done work that I was doing, but better because it was focused on graphic design and the, and the nature and narrative of design and with, with structure and things. I just thought my work just suddenly seemed rather flat and derivative and pointless because it didn't have any, any, any kind of real... At the time, I didn't see my own value in it you know that fact it was to do with language and poetry so I was, I was in my little dark wood and I was going home on the tube I used to draw all the time on the tube and um I just had this idea because I, I I'm, I've been ill I think and my girlfriend had bought me the Dante's Inferno book by Tom Phillips to, to cheer me up and that's so how it's in my head and I just suddenly thought well I could just do illustrations I could I, I, I talk to, do this little picture of, of me printing a piece of paper in the letterpress. That is actually the, you know, that is me printing. Tomorrow I will print and I will make this piece of artwork. And I went home and I started working. I had my stencil sets. Obviously I had no computer. There wasn't, I did not have a Mac. I had stencil sets at home and inks. And I started planning Canto One of the Divine Comedy of the Inferno and how I'd overprint it and how I'd overlay the letters. Because obviously it's like a jigsaw, you know, letterpress. And the next day, I printed the first canto, the dark wood. I went in the morning, I, I set it, I printed it throughout the day, I dissed it that night, I went home, I started the next one. And it was the single easiest piece of work I've ever done. It was the most obvious thing. It, was not, it wasn't even a thought as to how this is obviously how it would be. This is just waiting for you to happen to it. You know, and it was the most... For the most part, that period, I think, from that sort of probably November before Christmas until May, I suppose, maybe it would have been maybe a bit earlier than that. It was the most creative, I think, and focus I've ever been, I think. It was the most glorious feeling. So you've used, it, it, it's interesting, the, you started with stencils, but actually you went into letterpress because I guess it was immediate. You had that, you'd already had like some really positive experiences of letterpress as a student. But let's talk about the methods. You've got yourself into trouble by referring to the fact that you, you, you chose to focus on dead technology. <laughs> I'm going to give you a moment to redeem yourself in front of the typographic so world. I got told off so badly. What I did, what I meant was commercially dead technology. When I was a student, I think, I think Phil had worked on a, a big letterpress book, hadn't he? Didn't he have any types yeah. of Yeah, it was, I think, the, 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 the biggest and last big commercial letterpress job. And, but it, commercially it was, it was no longer a commercially viable process and people, you know, presses were getting rid of all their type and the art schools were getting rid of their type. And, uh, and obviously the typewriter had been superseded by word processors and by, by computers. And Electrostep very soon went the same way, you know, Electrostep was a ubiquitous, wasn't it? It was in every design studio. It was, it was how you created text. You know, I worked for the List magazine up in Edinburgh, which is like Time Out. Lovely magazine to work for. Robin Hodge was the uh, publisher. It was a lovely, lovely job. And we did all the, all the headlines for the covers in Electrostep. Uh, Simon Esterson designed it. And uh, Robin had um, hemorrhaged money to begin with. So I think everyone he met, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm running a magazine, come and work for me. And he had this huge roster of people working for him. And Simon has sort of set this, this template out, how do we produce a magazine? Robin was never, ever changed anything in case we lost money. So we, was, we were sort of a, 
beholden to Simon's will. <laughs> you know, he wasn't there. And um, so lecture set was a, it, it was, that's what you did. And then suddenly it, it had gone, you know, lecture set wasn't, all of it had kind of commercially, they had died. So they became, yeah, something else. What was the attraction for you in using those particular, in using those methods? Um, one thing was with the letter press in particular was the fact it was an addition. You know, if, if you were doing things with stencil sets, you'd make a one off. It was a unique object. And I've been doing mail art, art as in art in the post, which for the young folk uh, listening is where you put a piece of work into an envelope and you put a stamp on it and you walk to a post box and you put it in a post box and somebody will come and take it away from the post box to another post box and deliver it to somebody else. So it was snail mail. This. And uh, I, as long as you sat there turning the handle on the printing press, you could print endlessly. You could do editions of 200 as long as you didn't mind turning the handle. And and I, I, I think it's also, I mean, I just remember when I was working with letterpress as well as a student, it gave me absolute control over the process in a way that the that, that, that handing over a disc to somebody else to produce and print, I, you never knew what was going to come back necessarily. And it was just having the work unfold in front of me and thinking, oh, no, I need another half a point in there. I need, it, it was that ability yeah. to interact with the process that it gave you. We, we had a... A technician, Les and Dennis, who was technicians. Dennis looked like William Morris, and uh, Les used to run the CR Tronic machine, I think it was called, which was a prototype setting machine. And w we were taught um, one of our lectures, uh, it was um, about hanging punctuation in typographic niceties, you know, and we all wanted to do hanging punctuation, but apparently on the CR Tronic, it was a pain in the ass to type, to, to code. And used to get all this grief from Les about, oh, another bloody thing. Rhiannon, uh, was it Rhiannon Saunders Davis, it was, I think, taught us this. And uh, it, but with letter press, you could put the hanging punctuation in, and it, it didn't seem to be much of an effort. It didn't seem to be too much of a problem. So, like you say, there was a complete autonomy. You you just in the room, and you could you could do whatever you wanted. And uh, I'm also aware that I, because it was a, because you, you didn't have much time to print, you had to do all your workings out beforehand. So you had to be really, really thorough about what you were going to do the next day because you, you had to get on into the art school to set the type, print the type, disc the type, do the next one. So all my all my roughs were really quite thorough. Also, it was an assessable part, but you know, you handed the rough book in as part of your assessment. And I'm slightly horrified. That was the end print for that, with rivers of hell uh, flowing into each other. That was what the end print looked like. And uh, I'm aware that my, my, my roughs now are much, much more <laughs> tertiary things you know they're very very simple things because all I need to do is get an idea a notation of an idea and then I'll just go and use my letterpress so it's but that's really interesting it's like your thinking has evolved and now you're thinking through the making previously yes. you would have been thinking in advance and then thinking about executing your idea and it would have morphed and changed but maybe now you're a little bit more open to the I, th I think it's that, it's that thing, isn't it, about uh, unconscious incompetence. You, know, you, don't know, you don't know what you don't know. Then you become consciously incompetent where you're aware of what you don't know. I think, I suppose, at Chelsea, when I was doing the letterpress, I was consciously incompetent. Then you become consciously competent and don't think about it so much. I then, wondered about that. I wondered if the fact that it, the, the case from oh, the company oh, uh, was, was empty, uh, because people were, because everyone was in love with the Mac and that was the, you know, the computer room was the kind of place where the cool kids hung out. And I'm wondering if that's the fact that it was dead um, and that it was empty is what gave you license to think, oh, I can, I, I can go in there and I can start playing with words, which you, because I'm, I'm just also really struck that typography is one of those subjects that often really intimidate students and they just think, oh no, I can't possibly do that. But you just started playing, and I, I just wondered if you, if you think that the, the means had something to do with that. I think it probably did, yeah. Typography is always a cold shower of graphic design, isn't it? And um, I, the, the case from it had me in it, and then Jen Harrison, uh, I think one of my third year, Jen was in the first year, and she fell in love with it as well, so it was just the two of us would, that would use the case from for the most part. And you were completely... It was just yours. Nobody else ever really went in there very much, you know, apart from the induction session. And it, it was a, I don't know, I just found it a glorious process. I loved the idea that you could play with words and language. I loved the idea that you could see physically all this, these letter forms. You didn't have to guess what they were, you know, like people scroll through the max for the, for the font choices, you know, and the, you ask students sometimes what font to use. I don't know, it started with a T. You know, and there was this finite resource, so you, you got to know it very, very well. You got to, you, your map of it in your head 
was very strong, you know, so you knew what you could use and what you would want to use. I think that all those limitations and all the processes are inherent have limitations, but I think in some ways they they make you better. I mean, Rudy Vandal has, and he said when he was doing the Emogram magazine, he was he used some old software that he knew inside out, and that was when he was his most creative. And when his the print bureau said we, we've updated our systems, we can't use that software anymore. We had to go to Quark or whatever it was. And he said the software was suddenly so much more powerful than he didn't really enjoy it anymore. And he, I think that's when he first made the first change to the format because it wasn't it wasn't the same anymore. I guess he also had license to be a bit anarchical. And I think there's something quite interesting. I think Mika also picked that the, the Dante scholar that we mentioned before, she also picks up on this, that, 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 that there's something very anarchical about Dante as a text, but there's also something quite anarchical about your approach to the way that you've used all these technologies, which is, an, is, is totally subverting them and using them in ways and means that they were never <laughs> intended for and pushing them and experimenting with them. I mean, is that, you know, what? I think it's a certain sort of bloody mind in this, isn't there? I think anybody who's going to engage with letterpress or typewriter or, 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 or lecture set is, is a certain bloody mind in this. Vic, the technician at Lincoln, who used to look what I was doing, whatever I was doing, whether it was a letterpress work or typewriter work or, or lecture set, he'd always go, hey, the Mac can do that, you know? And I know the Mac can do that, but the Mac doesn't do it in the same way. Or you have to spend a lot of time faking it to make it look like you've done it in a different way. And I think there is, I think I mentioned the alchemy of print, you know, the, there's something special about printmaking. And I think the risograph's got that alchemy, you know, and the typewriter ribbon, the strike key has got that alchemy, and the letterpress has got that alchemy. And there's something magical about it. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm working in H.N. Volkman, you know, one of my huge influences, you know, for the letterpress, and then the, the concrete poets, going back to Flora Stacey in the 1890s, and people like Derek Bewley with Lectroset and, 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 and uh, uh, Steve McCaffrey, you know, both both through his carnival pieces and, and the Lectroset pieces he did. So I'm not, I know I'm not, I'm not breaking new ground ever. I know there's always a historic kind of reference. But isn't that, isn't that the point though, that connection with history and then always, but, you know, but kind of maybe bringing it forwards on, on different terms, not being a slave to the to the tradition of the technologies that slave to how things were used, but kind of pulling them forwards, but in new ways. Yeah, yeah, I think, yes, exactly. And I think the fact that they were all commercially gone, I mean, I, the, the, Les used to be slightly horrified at the mixing and matching of texts he used to go and double check the, the case room to make sure I put everything back in the right place. And when he found out I was, and Jim was the same, when he found out Jim was, he was he, he kind of started looking at what we were doing, and looking at it in terms of the print quality. And I mean, picking a piece of my work up and looking at it and looking at the back and actually saying, that's a damn fine piece of printing. And I remember with Jen, he always used to, he always used to, be in, always used to give his grief back cleaning the press, always. And uh, he'd always put, we say the press was clean and we put some white ink on the press and he'd run it and it would never be clean and we had to clean it all over again and jen was once she was she was so so adamant she's going to get the damn press clean she it was spotless and he put the white ink on it and it came out white it was perfect and jen said i told you the press was bloody clean and then les goes it's not anymore it's covered in white ink and he walked away <laughs> happy days 30 years is a long time to spend with a text okay. Technically. <laughs> <laughs> Albeit one as which is the Divine Comedy. It's obviously it's a text about faith and a text about humanity. What has it come to mean to you over that period? Um, and I suppose as a follow-up question, if making is a search for something, what have you found or what are you still looking for? I don't want to sound like Bono, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I do I did have this. Quote, um, obviously Dante, the beginning of the, of the Inferno, Dante wakes up in the dark wood, you know, midway through his life, and, and he wakes up in the dark wood, lost and afraid. And there's a wonderful quote from Jack Zipes, uh, inevitably they find their way into the forest, and it is there that they lose and find themselves, it is there they gain a sense of what is to be done. The forest is always large, immense, great and mysterious. No one ever gains power over the forest, but the forest possesses the power to change lives and alter destinies. And there was a, a Penguin book, uh, well, there was a question, I think, a questionnaire, I think, in a paper or something, and it said, name a book that's changed your life. And I thought, well, the Dante's Inferno, Dante's Divine Comedy has changed my life, you know. I did that initial project, 
which I sent off to Baseline magazine. And I met Don Lipper when he was at Lipper Pierce and stayed friends with him ever since. And he published, or they published the work in, lecture, in, in, in Baseline. And I went from somebody who was slightly eccentric, to put it mildly, in terms of my portfolio. And I got laughed at when I went and looked for work. I got laughed at because it was nothing that anyone could see as eyeballs, graphic design. But then it was in a magazine about graphic design. I was up with his coach fitters on the next page, you know. And I started getting work as a graphic designer. You know, I worked for Pones on the Underground. That was one of my first big typographic commissions. You know. And then I moved up to Edinburgh and I walked into, I'd been teaching in London on a foundation course. And I thought, well, maybe I could get some teaching. A naive thing to do. I just walk off the street into Edinburgh College of Art, the graphic design department, and ask if I can do some teaching. And Maggie Gordon, who was the head of the course at the time, just come up from Brighton. And a lot of, I think at the time, a lot of the old school staff who had been in the war were just retiring. And there's this new influx of staff coming in. And Maggie was looking at Baseline magazine, looking at the Dentist of Iron Comedy work uh, and saying, thinking to herself, well, I wish I could get someone like this in to come and teach. And I literally turned up with my portfolio of the work in it. And that got me my first teaching job. And you know, that took me from Edinburgh to Glasgow and, and to Lincoln. And then the, the works, you know, this, this chat here is because of that work. And I've been, you know, I was invited in Munich to be part of a, a text festival in Munich because of it and exhibited it in, thanks to Brenda championing it in, in Dublin and in, in London and the South Bank, you know. It's an insane thing to think of really, you know, just this little idea, a little note on your, on your sketch pad on the way home on the tube when you're in your tw early 20s and suddenly this thing. And I've always I've always gone back to it. Someone said about your life's work. It's, I've just done it alongside other stuff. I've done lots of other things as well. Um, if, I, if I'd realised maybe I'd have been more focused on this and made, made, made more of it in the last 30 years. And there's bits of time where I've not done it. I've just thought about it a lot. So it's, opened up a lot of, it's opened up a lot of opportunities for Oh, you. God, yeah, a huge amount. An unbelievable amount. You know, and it's it's and it means you're never really at a loss of what to do with the weekends either. And the typewriter thing is really kind of so you've written, I mean, you've written a book about type, you've written a couple of books about typewriter art, and that's kind of evolved out of the out of the opportunities of of, 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 of the purgatory. Yeah, um this is this is slightly I'm just gonna be really, really embarrassing uh, embarrassing myself now. Uh one of the things it also it was recently in an exhibition in the Ashmolean uh, and I met Monica Bisner and Jeff McEwen didn't meet Tom Phillips but his work was in the exhibition and it was um in the Ashmolean it was my piece of work on the wall my little Dante piece uh, halfway along our uh, journey to life's end I found myself a stream of dark woods since the right way to, to was never to be found and I was, I was in the same gallery as Rossetti and Blake and Dali and uh, Botticelli and all. <laughs> oh man, I was just in this gallery space thinking, Christ, this is insanely, this is mad, this is mad. But um, yeah, doing the typewriter work, I, I, I had a really good um, conversation with Joe Lightfoot at, at Lawrence King at the time. And uh, she, it's always a running joke that I'd always mention typewriters and typewriter art. And I always wanted, I thought Alan Medell's book was brilliant, you know. And then I about eight years of conversations about it. She finally emailed and said, I'm, I can't believe I'm doing this, but would you be interested in pitching a, a new anthology of typewriter art? I think three different people had mentioned that typewriters, you know, there was something in the air about typewriters. And uh, it, it ended up being the, the, the modern anthology of typewriter art, um, which again, was just a wonderful thing to be part of. And you were getting in touch with people that I'd long admired and most of them were quite old and their work had been forgotten and the typewriter had been forgotten and it was this glorious kind of re, people were excited about it again and there was one uh, one person's daughter he was quite frail but he was so excited that he got all his old work out and his daughter was emailing me with his pieces and there was a fantastic Zoran Popovic piece I really wanted to get and we couldn't find Zoran Popovic so I just I googled somebody called Zoran Popovic and wrote an email to them saying you know my name's Barry Tallyout I'm doing a, a book about typewriter art and I'm looking for Zoran Popovic the typewriter artist from the 1960s and about three months later I had this email saying dear Barry Tallyout my name is Zoran Popovic the typewriter artist from 1960s 
I was passed your email by Joanne Popovic, the filmmaker in 19, from the 1990s, who passed me your email from Joanne Popovic, uh, the, the <laughs> one who passed me your email from Joanne Popovic, the student. So this, 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 this every one of the Joanne Popovics had got in touch with another Joanne Popovic, this might be you. And it ended up with him, it, with the, the Joanne Popovic. It's brilliant. He sent me this work, it had never been published before, which you got in the book. It's a phenomenal thing. And then that fed in turn back into your into the into the typographic work that you were doing. It fed back into the Dante, just as your sort of as your typewriter horizons sort of expanded. Yeah, yeah. Because I, 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 you know, I, I, I thought there'd be maybe twice as much as there was in the Alamadel book, which is when I pitched the book to Lawrence King, I suggested twice as many illustrations, and it, it could have been four times as much. You know, and the, the, the amount of people I met and the amount of work I got sort of sudden saw, it was phenomenal phenomenal you could do another book now and it would be work that never been that's never been collated together you know never it would be a completely new book when you're describing the process of working on the typographic dante nobody seems more surprised than you do uh, about about how it's all worked out um and there's a great quote um again from mika's um really lovely writing about your project where she talks about dante as being the quintessence of poly polyphony and she talks about that being in the medieval sense of like a concord of voices, but in a more modern sense of a discourse constantly fluid, in the making, self-doubting and self-questioning. And I find so many echoes between, again, between Dante. So we've had the, the anarchy of the writing, the anarchy of the practice, uh, and we have the self-doubting in the writing and the self-doubting in the discussion and in the practice. Are you ever going to feel that you've you, that, 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 that you've achieved something are, are you ever going to kind of look back and, and not be riven with self-doubt about the project it's just the, it's a kind of universal issue i think that we as met so many designers have that we're constantly undermining i, I think yeah no I, I i don't think so i'm uh, I, used, I used to know um somebody whose mum's best friend was michael palin's wife and uh, Michael Palin's having a party and her best friend invited my friend's mum to it and her husband wouldn't go because he was too embarrassed to go to Michael Palin's house but I, I thought I'd go because it was Michael Palin and we all loved Monty Python you know who I knew was amazingly jealous I got to go to Michael Palin's house and he had a train set I think in his in the in the, in the granny house in the back of the garden and he said the, the thing he'd wished he'd done was be the Reverend W. Audrey and written the Thomas Tank in your stories, that was the thing that he, he regretted not doing those. And you think about everyone wants to be you. And you look at, you know, I read your work and I look at the stuff you do and the things that Phil does and the people you admire and you, you think if I was them, I'd be content. But you know that they're the same as you, aren't they? They're always looking for the next thing. And there's been elements and times when I, when I felt this is, this is magical, you know, I've got to perform the song for an art school on stage in the Whitechapel Art Gallery. <laughs> this is quite a nice thing to be doing and you know i, I got to go <laughs> when i was at the I had the show at the south bank you know it's amazing and, and chris mckay kept saying to people this is barry teller the artist and i kept saying i'm not an artist i'm just i'm, I'm graphic i'm just a graphic designer i'm not an artist just a graphic designer see there's no justice out. i'm a graphic designer but, and uh, then he gave me the key to the artist list and I, and first, I thought oh fuck it, i am an artist i'm in the artist <laughs> and uh, I, I think there's always that I did, I did a talk about the work at the NCCD and I said, you know, I did exhibitions and they, they came to nothing. Somebody said, you know, it's quite, it's quite angry, I was quite angry at you because, you know, you've done all these things and, and this person, they said they'd been working for a long time and never achieved any of those things. You know, their work had never been picked up by a gallery and never had an exhibition at the South Bank or been invited to Munich. And then, and then you say it's nothing. And I thought, I suppose it's because originally I always thought that the work would be published in the book you know, like Tom Phillips's, like Mandelbaum, Barry Moser. And I suppose that it's wonderful the things that the work has done. It's glorious, you know, it's been picked up in books and magazines and it's phenomenal. You know, it's, it, I can't believe it's done it, but I suppose at the back of my head is always that one thing that it's not, isn't, it isn't a book. So it's not know. finished. No, well, it's kind of finished, but it's not. How did they ask, but what's next? Um, 
Oh, so I find things like the typewriter, right, right, you mentioned before, you know, I've just written, uh, edited a book on uh, Keith Armstrong's typewriter art, and I'm hopefully going to meet Jeremy Adler in a couple of weeks and talk about his work. So there's a kind of little thread going on there. And uh, so there's 100 cantos, which means 100 illustrations, but Tom Phillips did 139 illustrations and he only did the Inferno. So he did 34 cantos, but did three illustrations each plus end papers. And Sandow Burke, has done 180 illustrations because he did um he did all three books for design comedy so i think it's a challenge there i want to do more than else. i want to do more illustrations than anybody else and are you going to go back to stencils which is where your illustrations your your very first sketchbook started with stencils and i thought there's a technology yeah, yeah i have i have uh, quite a large amount of stencils which i've collected by mistake um so yeah, the idea, one of the other things I'm thinking is that all the books of the Divine Comedy have maps. They have maps of hell and heaven and purgatory and all these things. And I thought I would, I would use stencils to typographically create the maps so that they will draw the three books together. That will be how the three books will be connected. So they have very radically different um, typographic illustrative styles. Um, and Brenda Dermody uh, mentioned the idea of actually making the books very different as well, both in terms of their typesetting and their size, which horrified me as a kind of like something nerdish that you'll be the same size and same shape. But I'm coming around to a point of view. So the thing that we're connecting will be the, the maps will be all done in the same way using using stencils. Well, I'm really glad to find, you know to hear that you're going to keep, be keeping yourself busy for maybe another 30 years with the project. We're just about coming to the end of the time of our sort of conversation. So I just wanted to finish with a quote, which is from Mika. And she says, what differentiates Tullet's work from the efforts of everyone who has grappled with Dante's visual impact before them is that although he too seeks to translate Dante's poem across time while retaining its essence, he uniquely succeeds in giving it a form that is unprecedentedly new, almost beyond temporality or space. His, illustra his illustrations for a typographical Dante intriguingly stand apart from everything that has preceded them, yet without breaking up the tradition he wishes to join, enhance, germinate in so many ways. Thank you for germinating much thought in all of us. Thank you. Uh... Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for, for listening in. We don't know how many people are listening. I'm assuming it's not just us. <laughs> yeah. we, have, we have quite a lot. But uh, I just wanted to thank both of you so much on behalf of uh, everybody who's tuned in and on behalf of uh, ISTD. Um, it's been such, I've been so absorbed for a full hour. It's been a really interesting packed with information a conversation it's I think you know the content is going to be really valuable for students for researchers I think it's really important what's been discussed this evening just for the the practice for the discipline um, and uh, Barry I think probably all of these things are happening and it's really taken off because you're ready and maybe you weren't ready until about five or six years ago uh, and it's it's really timely and it's really good and Catherine, again, I, I want to thank you so much for your insightful and for your nuanced and knowledgeable questioning and interrogation of the subject and, and this really rich conversation uh, with Barry. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Catherine, I mean, we, we've heard so much from Barry and it's been really wonderful uh, and I had your insights as well, Catherine. But I suppose um, one of the things I wanted to find out from you, it, you know, in giving you the invitation to come and do this this evening, it was really uh, because it struck me how much uh, the Dante exhibition in the South Bank kind of seemed to resonate with you when you went to see it. And I know you returned and it was just maybe to hear from you what the work means to you. Uh, for me, I think the thing, uh, but uh, it's beautiful. So that, yeah, it's absolutely stunningly beautiful. It's, it's, it's experimental, but the thing that I that resonates most for me is the sheer bloody mindedness of having that idea and of seeing it through little by little by little by little and building and growing and I just 
what I what I think about is how many of us have had an idea for a project that's 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 kind of got snuffed out or lost or overwhelmed, and 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 I just love that long term achievement, <laughs> and and that something like an idea and that seed, especially those things that we had when we were students or those passions that we had, yeah. and it's just grown and grown and grown into this phenomenal body of work, and that which has in turn fueled other things. Things. And I think, and Barry always says, it's not my, it's, I just do it on the side. I just do this thing on the side. It's just a little thing. And it's phenomenal. <laughs> it's absolutely phenomenal. So that for me um, is why. And it's so rich. So yes, going to the, going and seeing the exhibition, uh, you have to, you know, I just had to go back because it's so rich to spend time with it. Agreed. Agreed. I think that's a really good note on which to end uh, food for thought for everybody. So uh, maybe we'll close here. Um, Catherine, Dr. Catherine Dixon, thank you so much. Barry, no, Tullin, thank you so much uh, for a really brilliant evening. And, and uh, this will be available. The recording will be available to watch um, shortly after this and will be available on the ISTD website. So thank you and good night. Thank you very much. Thank you.